And this is some, some sampling, uh, something that I call the Swiss Army knife of uh, machine learning because it's been used in so many places. A different name for my talk could be squeezing a 96 uh, pages long tutorial into 25 minutes. Um, this is, of course, impossible task, but uh, I hope I will give you some uh, links and some uh, thoughts to take with you home and to see whether you can uh, use uh, this uh, amazing algorithm uh, in your uh, business. So, Thomson sampling was invented more than 80 years ago in 1933, and it was uh, mainly ignored for the last 80 years, but recently it became very popular in many, many uh, fields due to some uh, very uh, sub, uh, substantial uh, papers, which shows that it really works. So why do we need some, some sampling? Life is much more interesting than supervised learning, okay? This is not a very politically correct uh, saying here, but life is more complicated. You make actions and you get some reward on those actions. And uh, sometimes it's better to try what you already know, but maybe it's better to explore and see something that you don't know really sure about whether it's better or not. So usually in life and in many business situations, you don't really have data of dogs and cats lying around and you just need to discriminate between those. Usually you need to make agents, robots, uh, which plays with the world, interact with the world, and you need to decide what is the best things to do. Now, application of Thomson sampling, which solves this kind of problem that I've just talked about, the problem where you need to explore and exploit, is uh, ubiquitous. You can find it in revenue management, in marketing, in website optimization, A-B testing, internet advertisement, recommendation system, uh, deep learning, hyper-parameter tuning, and so on and so forth, and it's been used by top companies like uh, Amazon, Adobe, Facebook, LinkedIn, Microsoft, Netflix, Twitter, and so on and so forth. So it's a very popular and hot, hot subject that not many of you, uh, of us, uh, at least me on my uh, like surrounding community, I didn't hear many people uh, use it. So why do we need actually to solve this kind of uh, problems in Platica? In Platica, it's a B2C company. So we have users which we buy through ads. This is like the pipe here. And the users start playing the game. Platica is a game company. And uh, once user, users uh, stopped enjoying the game or had enough, they start leaving. And uh, in order to solve these problems, we need to interact with users and interact with the ad space, ad community. So we need to interact with the real world and we need to solve problems where we have exploration and exploitation. Other fields in Platica are like pay, uh, player prediction. By the way, I forgot to say my name is Hanan Stengart. I work for Platica. Uh, this is the second time I walk in the uh, talk about uh, uh, DS in the summit. Uh, last year I talked about how to interrupt uh, deep learning models. So you can look it up uh, in the web. So player prediction is one thing that we do. And artificial players is another thing that we do. Optimized control and user acquisition, oops, I have a spelling mistake here, is the, uh, the third thing that we do is actually something that uh, brought me into learning about this topic of top sampling. And we also do recommendation and personalization. We have tens of data scientists, tens of data engineers, and we process about six terabytes per day. So to understand why do we need uh, such an example, uh, such a, to solve such a problem, the most known problem is the multi arm body problem. You can imagine a, a, a gambler, or maybe an octopus, goes into a casino and there are several slot machines and it needs to try them out in order to understand which works better. Once it knows which uh, slot machine works better, it can start exploiting it and get all the money out of it. Maybe the probability to win there is higher than another machine. But uh, it's, uh, this octopus has a dilemma, right? Because there is a trade-off between exploitation and exploration. Let's say there are 100 machines. Maybe we need to try them all before we start uh, to exploit them. Maybe we need to give up uh, something that we think is optimal in order to learn more on something that we are not sure about. So a naive approach, which is also called the Tao follow the leader, or A-B testing, is uh, to try them for a while, understand which one is the best, and then just do that. So, uh, in theory, it can be proved that this is very, very not efficient. So, who has done A-B test in his life? Okay, so it's not efficient what you're doing. You should use Thompson sampling. So, uh, 
let's start with an example, the Bernoulli case. Let's uh, imagine that there are k action, like those slots machine, and for each slot machine there is a top probability to win, and your objective is to maximize your reward uh, throughout t periods of time. Now an interpretation for this, for the real world, is uh, let's say ad tech. Ad tech is one of the biggest uh, fields uh, where machine learning is uh, used, and usually people uh, in ad tech business ask stuff like, which banner should I present to the uh, user? Or I talked with someone from Fiverr, uh, she, they need to uh, show uh, people uh, what kind of service they would like to, to have. And the success is associated with a click or of the net or a conversion of the user. And the parameters which are not known are the, let's say, probability to click or probability to convert. So these two problems are actually the same, it's just two different framing. Here we call it MAB or multi arm bandit, and here we call it add uh, monetization, optimization, but these uh, problems are actually the same. And uh, small scale experiments to solve this kind of problem became really a, a very dominant tool in modern uh, internet companies. How is it different uh, than supervised learning? So I already said it, it's not a pr very politically correct lecture. Supervised learning is boring, right? It's pretty easy. You get labels and you just train your deep neural networks and that's it. And unsupervised learning maybe is interesting, but you cannot know how good you are doing what you're doing, right? You can lie to everyone and say your anomaly detection works perfectly. But in reinforcement learning, which is, I feel, uh, uh, is their true artificial intelligence problems, you both don't have supervised learning. It's not like you have labels or data. And you can measure how well you're doing what you're doing. So. Uh, from these three types of learning, I feel this is the most uh, challenging one. You are driving what you are training on. It's your decision which ca uh, creates the next uh, data sets and the next labels. There is a feedback loop. And it's not like you need to uh, dis uh, discrepanize between dogs and cats. Now, the simplest, if someone knows supervised learning and he tries to do it, we use it everywhere, right? It's like when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So what would the, the a supervised uh, learning expert would do for such a problem? He will say, okay, I, s I got some actions, and for each action, I have some, uh, I can learn what is the expected reward. So I have action one, two, three, four, five. And let's say I learn those parameters of the problem, which transform X, which is the action, into a reward. Now what do I need to do in order to optimize my reward? Well, I can build an optimizer. Let's say it's a greedy optimizer. It just asks this supervised learning model, hey, what would be the reward if you choose action one? Hey, what would be the reward if you choose action two? And so on and so forth. And then you know what is the optimal thing to do, right? Eh, wrong. This will not work. Or it will work very badly. Why would it fail? It would fail because you don't explore. Let's assume we have three um, candidate actions, three ma slot machines, or three banner banners which we can show to the user in the website. And for two of them, we actually collected a lot of data, so we are pretty sure what is the probability to convert. 0 0.4 here and 0 0.6 here. This is, of course, uh, not a realistic situation because conversion rates are much, much lower. But just for the sake of uh, example, let's assume that we know really what's going on with these two because we've sampled already 200 users with this banner and 200 users with this banner. And this QT here, action number three, which is like, let's say it's a new ad, okay? And we sampled only 10 users with it and we are not really sure about the conversion rate. Okay, we are not really sure about the conversion rate. What would the optimizer do? It will ask the supervised learning, hey, which one is optimal? So which one is optimal uh, from expectation point of view? This would be the blue one. But then we will show only the blue one and we'll not learn about the red. And red might be actually better. So let's see it in an example. By the way, uh, probably th most of you think, hey, I can just explore once in a while. Once in a while, I'll show a random ad, right? So I have three ads. I'll choose the blue one mainly, but sometimes with probability epsilon, I will show ads that I'm s less certain of. Well, this also is not very optimal. TS, which is Thompson sampling, does it much better. 
Why does it does it, does it much better? It does it much better because Thompson something does something which is very intuitive, and until now even people are not sure why it works so well. Okay, so the the intuition is choose with probability the action which is uh, by the probability that it's the best. So if I have three pro uh, possible actions to make to take, I will choose with probability 80% the action which is 80% probability to be the best. And this is actually aims exploration in towards places where we believe it's, uh, it's beneficial. It makes no sense to explore uh, an action which we believe it's really, really bad, which is what Epsilon Greedy does. Here, we get rid of action which are really bad and we explore only action which are likely to become better. Um, so, since I have only 25 minutes, I will not be able to uh, deep dive into this. I hope some of you are familiar with it. This is just a way to convert, uh, let's say we have uniform uh, prior on the probabilities of winning. So, once you get data, you can update those priors. Uh, this is also called the uh, um, dummy counters. So, in usually when we have probabilities, we just count k out of n. We had k success out of n attempts, but this uh, ignores the prior. Once we have a prior with alpha or beta, we can uh, update those priors. So, if we got a loss, we keep it the same, but if we got a win, we update those alpha and betas, and this is how you can get posterior distributions on, uh, on fractions or on a uh, fraction of uh, b between k and n. How does the... Uh, uh, Thompson something different than being greedy. So in greedy, we just choose which action is the optimal. So alpha divided by alpha plus beta is uh, similar to saying I got k, uh, k wins out of k plus n minus k losses. So this is uh, the probability of, of winning with a s several a specific lever. And we just choose uh, according to it. So we are actually doing being greedy. In Thompson sampling, we actually sample the distribution from the, pr from the posterior. And once we sample from the posterior, actually what will happen is equivalent for saying the probability I will choose something is equal to the probability I believe this is the best thing to do. But it's not uh, uh, deterministic, it's a stochastic choice. Here, it's, uh, on the left, it was a deterministic choice. So let's assume that we have these th uh, three levers. Uh, levers, sorry. One of them is the probability to win is 0 0.9, 0 0.8, and 0 0.7. And we, once we do it by uh, using a greedy algorithm, and once we do it with the Thompson sampling, so you can clearly see that Thompson sampling uh, through time selects almost in 100% of the time the best optimal action, while greedy algorithm is stuck in a very low performance. And even if you add epsilon greedy and stuff like that, it will not work as well as Thompson sampling. Now it can be generalized much beyond a uh, slot machine which have a uh, probability to win, uh, like distribution of the world, just zero uh, Bernoulli. It can be generalized to actually every distribution of a scalar reward. And this is how, I will not go into it, but uh, you have it in the in slides which you can download later from my GitHub account. Sometimes computing, so let's summarize. Thompson sampling actually is saying probability matching. Act according to the probability that you, you think action is the best. But computing this probability is uh, sometimes very, very difficult. I just show you a case where it's very simple. You have counts, the prior is beta, so the, because the prior is conjugate prior to the Bernoulli distribution, everything is nice, and you can solve it on a piece of paper, and the posterior is also beta, but life is much more complicated. So usually you cannot uh, write um, like a, a final solution for the posterior uh, distribution. So there are approximation methods. Some of them are really well known, like Gibbs sampling, others are le maybe less known. But my favorite is bootstrapping. It's fa my favorite because it's so easy, right? What does bootstrapping mean? So the name comes from maybe the, the story from Eichenhausen when he he raises himself by pulling the bootstraps of the of the boot. So uh, you raise yourself. You're doing something uh, without uh, by the, the data that you already have. So we have some history, 
and we create fake history. So we have collected some data from the, let's say, from the website of users and whether they uh, uh, clicked on the banner or not. Now we can create fake, fake data. How do we create fake, fake data? But bootstrap sampling. We just take the data and we uh, select it with the return again and again. So we have the dis a new data set which is distributed the same like the original data set but is not equal to it. By the way, who knows what is the probability for a sample to appear in the new uh, fake sample? What is the probability to appear here? So if XK appeared in the original data, what is the probability for it to appear in the new data set? It's one over E. It's a home exercises for you. So, uh, and once we have this fake data, which we created by sampling our original data, we can uh, look at which one uh, maximizes the likelihood of the estimator. Okay, we can just take this fake data, put it in the estimator, in, uh, maybe in our case it's just the expectation, just the mean, and see how th this, this uh, distributes and select according to this posterior. So by bootstrapping, we actually do not need to do all the Bayesian computation and stuff. So you can see here the performance of several uh, approximation methods compared to the analytical solution here. And you can see how well Bootstrap follows the anal analytical solution. So without doing all these posterior integrals, which could be really mess, using Bootstrap uh, can save you a lot of time. Practical consideration. So until now, I showed you like the toy examples of levers, levers or website with users which interact with uh, ads, and all users are equal, were born equal. So th this is a really different from real life scenario. In real life, you life is much more complicated. How is life more complicated? First, usually you don't know really the prior. So here you can see t uh, two uh, trajectories trajectory of learning when the prior is correct and when the prior is wrong. So once you use the wrong prior, you will get a, a worse performance. And learning this prior could be a problem by itself. This is one complication of the solution. Second, usually we have some help information. Let's assume users, we know something about them. We know which country they come from, we know uh, when did they come to the website, maybe we have some historical data of the user, when we, did we see it last, her last. Okay, so this could be uh, denoted as Z. It's another variable which tells us a context of our decision. So we need to take, to do Thompson sampling, which is contextual Thompson sampling, or in the literature it's called contextual uh, bandits. It's when we make decision based on some information that we have. It's uh, actually it's a reduction of reinforcement learning to the case where we are stateless. So this is another complication that we have. A third complication is that life is not stationary. Sometimes people might like cheese in the website, but the next day they like to, to, to buy something else. Okay? Milk. I don't know. So until now, we assume that everything is stationary, but in real life, it's not. So actually, there is a extension of Thomson sampling to the case where we assume that data is uh, non-stationary. It just changes a bit the update, update uh, equations, but the main concept remains the same. And here you can see comparison between two uh, models. One of them uh, assumes stationarity, and the other is, does not. So you can see that. Uh, in the first, maybe the non-stationary solution uh, is better, but then uh, the non-stationary uh, solution works better than the stationary one on a non-stationary problem. And oh, by the way, all these figures are taken from the tutorial that I showed uh, the citation of in the first slide. And it's, I forgot to say, but it was written by top uh, people from, uh, uh, from top university and from DeepMind, Google, and others. Thank you. Last but not least, concurrency. So until now, I've uh, described a situation where every time step, you can select only one action. So I can select whether to show add A, add B, or add C. Or the octopus could select lever A, select lever B, or C. But usually, in real-life scenario, you don't make one action, but you c uh, create a batch of actions. 
So uh, let's say in website you cannot choose for each user which website, uh, which banner to, to present, but you can do it for every, I don't know, 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes you get a lot of users. So every time you update your policy, you, you see a lot of data. And this is what's called uh, concurrency. The ability to select multiple action per step. So every time we do a step, you, you run a, a actually different, many, m several experiments on your, uh, on your environment and you get a lot of data points. And uh, this actually makes uh, learning faster because it's like running an experiment in parallel. So I will skip the details of that due to lack of time. When does it fail? So until now I described uh, the Swiss Army knife, right? It's very good, it works well and so on. But actually, sometimes it fails. When does it fail? It fails when we don't really care about exploration. We ca it fails when we don't care about exploitation. And it, cares, uh, it fails when we are very time sensitive. Let's say we have only, a ve our horizon of making decisions is very small. So it's maybe better to just exploit than explore. And it uh, fails when uh, there are some hint in the data which gives you more information than what you think. So for, uh, we got to three minutes left for questions, so I will just mention that we are hiring, as everyone. And uh, we will hire in different fields, and uh, the most important one for this audience is data science. So you're all welcome to visit our website. And now we, we have uh, three minutes for questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Amit, for the question. So bootstrapping, how is it being used? So when I may uh, say bootstrapping, I say that for each action, we got some data of, uh, if let's say for each banner, you have some user who clicked it and some who did not. And now we need to know whether action A, banner A, is better than banner B. So you can do bootstrapping in order to measure what is the probability for one ad to be better than the other. How? By creating different histories out of the original history by uh, sampling with return. It's called sampling with return, right? With replacement, thank you. It's something that will sound wrong for me. Sampling with replacement. And once you do that, you have different copies of history for each one of the ads. And then you can measure how likely is a, ad A to be better than the B. Okay? Another question over there? Sorry, it's too, uh, too far away for me to hear. Can you step into the mic here? And we have one minute and 30 seconds, so you have to run. Another question? Okay, so bootstrapping uh, allows you to compute a probability. If you just use the history, you will get just a, a greedy answer. If you just use the history, probably ad A is better than ad B, just because here you have 50 conversion of, out of 100, and here you have 40 conversion of, out of 100. But it does not really say that action ad A is necessarily always better than B. It might be by, by, by chance. So by bootstrapping, you actually can compute the probability for it to be better, and not just the observation that it's better. If you are greedy and you just follow what has been seen to be better, you do not explore. And then, as I showed, performance is much lower than what you can get when you explore. Yes? Delay the word. It's a... Uh, it's a pain. <laughs> there is a paper I can send you later which uh, discuss those problems. But uh, the, the context or the framework usually in, uh, in contextual bandits is an uh, immediate reward. Yes. So time is up. Thank you guys.